Let's just go ahead and, and start in prayer. Father, we just thank you for today. God, we just bless you. Thank you for your word once again. Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Lord, you show us your ways through the word. Lord, your ways aren't hidden. They're all revealed in Christ and in your word. God, we just thank you for that this morning. We just invite your Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts, God, to, to speak to us, to show us uh, things to come, Lord, and how we should be living in this moment, in this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, yeah, we talked about uh, last time, end times, you know, a clear view. Uh, we went through Daniel in chapter 7 and chapter 8, and we, we may read some of that and just take a little more time with that this time. Um, so we saw that in Daniel chapter 7 and 8, Daniel, actually it was ne King Nebuchadnezzar got a vision that Daniel interpreted uh, of the uh, four kingdoms of the earth that would be revealed in human history. You know, the Babylonian kingdom, the head of gold, the Medo-Persian empire, which was the, the silver uh, chest and shoulders, and then uh, the kingdom of Grecia, the brass, and then the iron for, for the kingdom of uh, Rome, and the iron and the clay, which is the revised Roman Empire, uh, which um, is, is in our day, in our time. And uh, we read there also how the stone cut out without hands came down from heaven, struck the statue in the feet, which is very significant. It shows us, you know, when Christ is coming because the stone cut out without hands that, that struck the statue in the feet and it destroyed all those kingdoms and they became the, like the dust of the summer uh, threshing floor, you know, the chaff uh, were, were blown away by the wind and the, the stone became a great mountain which filled the whole earth. And in Daniel chapter 8, all of these kingdoms are also compared to, to beasts, you know, and uh, so the, the head of gold, the Babylonian kingdom is compared to the lion with wings, the Medo-Persian empire, the bear that was raised up on one side. Uh, the two kingdoms of the Medes and Persians, the Medes were stronger. And then the uh, uh, third beast was the leopard uh, with four wings, very swift, Alexander the Great. And the fourth one was Rome, and uh, again then the revised Roman Empire, which was described as, as a beast. Um, so, praise God. Um, so if we look at, actually if we look at Daniel in chapter 1, we'll just read this real quick here. So it says, in the first year of King Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. And Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea and four beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given unto it. And behold, another beast, a second, like unto a bear, raised up on one side. It had three ribs in, the, in its mouth between the teeth of it, and they uh, said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. And this I beheld, and to another, uh, like a leopard, which upon the, upon the back of, of it were four wings, wings of a fowl, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given unto it. And this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, a strong, and strong exceedingly, and it had iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and trampled the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the other beasts uh, that were before it, and it had ten horns, and that, that plays into... Uh, the fourth beast of, of that, you know, is in the book of Revelation, which is in our time, the revised Roman Empire. Um, verse 8 says, And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, behold, uh, sorry, before whom there, there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Okay, this, this uh, scripture always brings you back to the omnipotence of God, you know, the sovereignty of God. Um, and it says, His garment was white as snow, his hair uh, of his head was pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands of thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand 
stood before him. That's 100 million. And judgment was set, and the books were opened. And I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the, the horn spake, again, this is the Antichrist, and beheld even till the beast was slain, okay, the government of the fourth kingdom. The beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning fire. And as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man, come with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and the kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So again, you know, when you've got uh, these four beasts and, and the four kingdoms, uh, it says again that, that Christ, you know, will come, the, the judgment will sit, you know, the, the ancient of days will sit and in judgment over the nations and over the kingdoms. Christ will receive uh, his kingdom. You know, it'll be an everlasting kingdom and there won't be any kingdoms after that. So um, we're really coming up to the end of, of history, you know, human history as described in the scripture, um, you know, as far as the kingdoms of the earth. So... So these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. Say the saints of the Most High. The saints of the Most High. <laughs> shall take the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Amen. That's us. That's you. That's me. Praise God. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. He obviously doesn't care about the people, does he? And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and the mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I mean, you're seeing in this day, um, even in the media and different persons and people who write certain books like God Delusion and different things, you know, such a, a voice being raised up against God, you know, to mock God, to to criticize God, to, to speak uh, great swelling blasphemies, you know, against, against God. You're hearing that more and more. I mean, I could name a particular actor, uh, which, which I've heard, which he, I mean, the way that he was talking about God, I couldn't believe it. You know, you just wouldn't do it. And, and that's that same spirit. It's that same spirit. And you're seeing that more and more out there. Um, but it says, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, again the saints, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Praise God. And he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings which shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. This is the Antichrist kingdom, and again, it's based on a power-sharing agreement. It's exactly what you see, like in the European Union, the European Commission. You know, they're unelected. Uh, they they have positioned themselves in that place um, through through their treaties, which they they kept forcing through. We looked a bit at that last time we came together. You know, the way that they've set one treaty upon another and just built up something that you can't get rid of now are very, very difficult to get rid of. Britain literally had to, to force its way out uh, to get out from under that, that rule um, because uh, it is, a, again, a power-sharing agreement there. Um, they're promising these leaders of nations and the European Council and all that, promising them great power, great authority. You know, you can rule over all of Europe, never mind your, your little nation. You know, um, and that's that's the model that um, Satan is trying to use all over the earth, you know, to to say, look, we'll make you wealthy. We'll make you powerful. Join us, you know, join our side. That's that's his calling card uh, for trying to, to bring nations on board. And some of that has been quite successful, I think. But anyway, <laughs> it's only for a season. Um, so this um, other horn, this one that subdued the three kings. So there's another horn which rises up. And it subdues three of those other kings that are power sharing with the Antichrist. And it says, he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times, seasons, and laws. And you see all, all around the world right now, they're trying 
you know, governments are, the liberal governments are trying to change laws, you know, times, seasons, you know, to, to try and redefine everything that, that was traditionally held as true. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, the sex, uh, male and female, you know, that's, that's a biologically binary fact. You know, it's, it's a DNA fact. You're either male or female, and yet they say now, oh, you can choose whatever you want. You know, or marriage, which has been traditionally, again, between a man and a woman, uh, you know, they're saying you, you can marry, you know, anyone, anything. <laughs> yeah, I was, kinda, I was thinking of you can marry your dog, but <laughs> okay. But the judgment shall sit, and they, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Again, the judgment shall sit. If you remember, you know, in King Nebuchadnezzar's day, it says that, that there was like a council in heaven, like, uh, you know, cherubs or something, you know, it's... Uh, these angels uh, that, that, that sat in, in judgment and, and uh, judged that Nebuchadnezzar had lifted himself up against the Most High, you know, and, and judgment was, was placed upon Nebuchadnezzar, which humbled him for seven years, <laughs> you know, gave him the heart of a beast and let his, his back be wet with the dew of heaven, you know, until such times as he understood that it's the Lord God, you know, who rules in the kingdoms of men and he sets over it whom he will, you know. I like the fact that the Bible says that Jesus has received all authority. Jesus said, I have received all authority in heaven and in earth, and in earth. And that's a wonderful part. So, praise God, judgment shall sit, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Again, that's us. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Praise God. So we're in Christ. Amen. So hitherto is the end of the matter. So, and, and Daniel was, was troubled uh, by all this. And so Daniel chapter 8, again, it, it, it talks about this. You know, it talks about the, the kingdoms, again, being defined. Um, Daniel saw in a vision, again, the, the four kingdoms. And uh, he lifted up his eyes. Behold, there was uh, by the river a ram which had two horns and you know so you get the ram and you get the he goat the ram is uh, uh, Mede and Persia the he goat is Alexander the Great and uh, then after that um, after that it says uh, I saw until the ram was moved with color against him smote him okay cast down to the ground but and it, it goes on um, so that's uh, the Grecian kingdom gets divided. So last time again, we also, we talked about, you know, how God puts together the, the times and the seasons. You know, we, we talked about the times. We talked about how in Acts chapter 17, it says, um, talking about God, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined... Okay, determine their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope after him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And again, so he's set their pre-appointed times. And there is an overarching, um, um, you know, a chronology that, that God uh, has set in, in place. There's only so many things that, that can happen. You know, God has boundaries on what humanity can and can't do and on their times. Um, and you see different aspects of this. It's really interesting in Matthew 1.17, it says here, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations and from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations and from the captivity in Babylon until Christ <clears throat> are 14 generations. You know, it's a, it's a symmetry that God has kind of worked in, which is, is really cool. And uh, and so uh, we also, we looked at Daniel's 70 weeks, you know, how in the book of Daniel, again, in Daniel chapter 9, um, he, uh, Daniel chapter 9, the Lord had, had said that there would be uh, 70 weeks determined uh, on the children of Israel um, for the people and for the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay, and, and seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem 
until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, seven weeks and 62, so that's 69 in total. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So at the end of 69 weeks, from the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem to the time the Messiah is cut off, but not for himself, okay, it shall be 62 or 69 weeks in total. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that talks about the Roman invasion, you know, in 70 AD um, uh, under Titus. And the end of it shall be uh, with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So, um, so that's talking about, you know, how the Gentiles basically overran Jerusalem and Israel and Palestine and all that, uh, you know, until Israel was restored as a nation in 1948. And uh, so, again, that 70 weeks, it's absolutely amazing. There's 70 weeks. 69 of those have already taken place. So you have, um, you have uh, 69 weeks, you know, starting here at the commandment to rebuild the walls of Jer Jerusalem with King Artaxerxes, uh, rebuilding the Jerusalem wall, um, Nehemiah, and all that. That date is exactly given in the scripture in Nehemiah's chapter, you know, 1 and 2. And uh, that was 45 BC. And when you add up um, the days of 69, 69 weeks, and each week represents um, 49 years. So each day represented seven years. And when you add it all up, you've got 69 weeks equals um, 490 years. So 490 years. And um, the 49 years are Jewish years, so 360 days. And because they're, they're based on the lunar calendar. So it's 69 times 7 times 360, you get 173,880 days. And that brings you to April 6, 30 AD, the, the time when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem to offer himself as a sacrifice of Israel. Okay, we said that, right? You know, the, the Israelites at that time, the, the, the Jews, the Sadducees, Pharisees, the high priest, all of them should have known that the Messiah was coming into Jerusalem. That's why. Jesus said, look, you're having problems with what they're crying out. If they didn't cry out in praise, saying Hosanna, you know, to the son of David, um, if they didn't do that, the very rocks would cry out. The very rocks would cry out as Jesus is triumphantly entering into Jerusalem to be the Passover lamb. Praise God. But um, so um, we, we know that that God has set different time clocks in, in prophecy, and Israel is one of those time clocks. Okay, Israel is one of those time pieces. Uh, that God uses to, to show us what shall come. And uh, again, just let me go back there for two seconds. On the Daniel 70 weeks, you know, we saw the gap. The gap between um, the, the 69 week, there's one week left. And that's the 70th week of, of uh, Daniel's 70 weeks. That 70th week is the book of Revelation. You know, it's the seven years of the book of Revelation that the Bible talks about. And that space in between there, again, we covered this last week, was the uh, church age, which was a mystery and which was hidden. Uh, so that great space between the end of the 69th week and the uh, 70th week, which is the book of Revelation, all of that is the church age, which we saw was a mystery hidden in God. Uh, from the foundation of the world, but now was revealed to us through his holy prophets. So Israel, again, you know, it's a timepiece. It, it shows us um, where we are in God's calendar. Um, we know the, the prophecies concerning Israel about it becoming a nation again. Isaiah 66, all this was prophesied that Israel, uh, all the children of Israel would, that were scattered to the nations because of iniquity, because of judgment, uh, they would be brought back again to their own land. Isaiah 66 talks about, can a nation be born in a day? You know, Ezekiel 37, so, some beautiful scriptures. Um, it says, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. One king shall be ruler, ruler over them all and shall no longer be two nations. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. And they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and with their detestable things. I mean, this is things that God's 
uh, doing. You know, that's why he's brought Israel back. Um, and it says, it says, I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. That's what the Lord says about Israel today. And he says uh, in Jeremiah 16, it says, therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall be no more said the Lord that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Um, but the Lord who, who lives, uh, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. So that's the land of the north is Russia. And uh, it says it will be spoken of how the Lord brought all the children of Israel out of the lands of Russia and uh, from all the nations of the earth where they were driven. And I will bring them back into their own land, which I gave to their fathers. It's an everlasting covenant that Israel has with the land. You know, God gave them that, that land forever. And now, um, so in Matthew 24, the Bible actually talks about this, okay? It actually talks about this. It talks about Israel becoming a nation. So Matthew 24 says this, now learn the parable of the fig tree. So right after the, the Lord is giving them all the signs of his second coming, you know, they asked him and said, Lord, you know, when, when will all these things come to pass? What will be the sign of your coming? He gives them all of these wars, pestilences, famines, you know, persecution, earthquakes, you know, all of these different signs. But then he gives this sign as well. Learn this parable uh, from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, I've heard summer described as the millennium, okay? Uh, Benny Hinn says, summer is the millennium. I, I believe that. It, it just, it makes all the sense in the world. He says, know that summer is nigh. And uh, when you see the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender and it puts forth its leaves, well, Israel has been a nation now, you know, 1948, so you've got 52 and 22, so that's 74 years, 74 years old, right? Is, would that be described as its branches are yet tender? <laughs> okay, its branches, its leaves are yet tender. Puts forth its leaves, know that summer is nigh. Okay, that means the, the millennium. And so also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the door. Know that it's near. That's where we are right now. It's near, we're at the door. And it says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. That is key. That is so key. This generation shall not pass away till all things uh, which are written, you know, uh, take place here. And, uh, you know, when you hear other people teach on Bible prophecy, you can only take what they say, right? Unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, you can say, well, you know, yes, I heard this person say that and I heard another person say another thing. But when you get personal revelation from the Holy Spirit, then you know you've heard something, Right. I got personal re revelation on this, and uh, the Lord literally just opened my eyes. I hadn't had personal re revelation before on it, um, but years ago when uh, there was a, a gentleman called Harry Patch, Harry Patch, he was a World War I veteran who saw personally and firsthand the World War I trench warfare. He was a British soldier, and he was the last surviving British soldier to have experienced this. He was the last of his generation. He was 111 years old, and he passed away. And God spoke to my heart, said, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. This generation shall not pass away. When you see the fig tree spreading forth its branches, when its leaves are yet tender, this generation shall not pass away. That means somebody who was one day old, maybe they're a baby, they're one day old. I, I remember uh, <laughs> apparently my wife's grandmother, she was, I don't know, was she six months old or six weeks old uh, when the Titanic was launched uh, from Belfast. And apparently she was there, okay? She may not remember it, but she was there. She was part of the generation that, that would have been in that time and in that moment. And uh, it's the same with this, even a child that's, that's six days old when Israel became a nation in 1948. This is saying, Jesus is saying, that whole generation will not have passed away. Those who have experienced that will not, have, will not be gone before all these things are fulfilled. And again, we're 74 years down the road. Okay, so how long can people live? You know, so it's, it's, it's in our time frame uh, that these things will be fulfilled. And uh, I'll just, I'll, you know, Jesus doubled down on that he, here. But 
let, let me say this. Um, it was probably four or five years ago. Uh, we had a Christmas service, and I was talking about the first coming of Jesus. And, you know, you go through the Christmas story, you know, uh, Jesus being born of the Virgin Mary, becoming flesh. You know, the greatest shock to the Israelites of that time and that day when Jesus stepped into the earth in his, his first incarnation, his first appearing, the greatest shock was that that happened in their generation, in their time. I mean, when he said, Isaiah 61, I'm reading it for you. <laughs> Here in the synagogue, they all heard the gracious words. He said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And they're like, what? And they wanted to take him out and throw him off the brow of a hill. They said, what, you're the Messiah? You're it? And they wanted to kill him? That's crazy. <laughs> you know, that was the greatest shock. Well, the Lord spoke to me in that time. He says, the greatest shock for this generation is that we're it. We're it. Tell your neighbor, you're it. You're it. And uh, in our generation. And so we know the Bible talks about the characteristics of our generation. And, and uh, you know, in the last days, this, this will happen and that will happen. And men will be lovers of themselves and, you know, uh, just all boasters and proud and rebellious to parents and everything else. You know, it, it's, we're seeing it all around us, you know. But let me just continue on here. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, he said, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And he's saying, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words won't. So he doubled down on that. He said, this generation. And that's not unusual for God because he told Abraham in the fourth generation, you know, uh, your, your descendants will be captives in Israel, but they'll be there for 400 years. Sorry, captives in Egypt. They'll be there for 400 years, but I will deliver them with a great deliverance. You know, he gave them generations. You know, uh, Noah, the same way, Melchizedek, his names, when he dies, it shall come. You know, like the, the flood will come. And uh, so God revealed something to a generation. And when Melchizedek died, that was when Moses got into the ark with his family and God closed the door. You know, yeah, Methuselah, that's what I meant. What did I say? Oh, sorry, Methuselah. No. Me Noah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Noah went in the dark, and into the dark, into the ark. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So, yeah, Methuselah was the uh, longest living person, uh, 969 years. Um, and when he died, that was when God closed the door on the ark. Uh, with Noah and his family inside. So, um, but of the day and the hour knows no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So the day and the hour knows no one, even the angels of heaven. But, but just listen to that, the day or the hour. It doesn't say you won't know the time and the season. And we're going to get to that. Luke 21 also says this, there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and the, in the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. That means different people groups roaring and, you know, different rioting and uh, people causing all kinds of uproar. And it says men heart, men's hearts failing them for fear and expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth. We've seen some of that, you know, men's hearts failing them for fear. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. And then he spake a parable. Look at the fig tree. Back to the fig tree. Look at the fig tree all, and all the trees, like all the nations. Um, I'm, I'm told like there are over 220 nations now or something. There wasn't that many before. It's like they're all spreading forth and not every, every new people group wants their own country, you know. But, uh, and when they are already budding, okay, the fig tree, when they're already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. Again, the millennium. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. So that's written to us. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not, or will by no means pass away. Again, Jesus underlining that, this generation. So he said all this in answer to the question, you know, when shall all these things be? When shall be the sign of your coming? He's answering it right here. He's answering it. It says you won't know the day or the hour, but he's telling you the generation right here. He's telling you the generation. Exactly. 
Praise God. And he finishes it uh, with, Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Now, that, that is very, very interesting because what he says is, you know, don't let your hearts be weighed down with carousing, what, partying, kind of, you know, kind of lascivious, kind of unrestrained behavior and all this carousing, drunkenness, cares of this life, getting caught up in everything that's going on around us. You know, don't allow yourself to be caught up like that because it says that day would then come on you unexpectedly. In other words, what's Jesus saying? The day should not come on you unexpectedly. You should expect the day. When you know the season, you should expect the day. The day will not come on you unawares, you know, unexpectedly. And we're going to see more of that. And he says, for it will, it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That you're counted worthy to escape. Say escape. <laughs> escape all these things. People think that the body of Christ is going to go through the tribulation. I don't believe that. And we're going to see more scriptures that, that, uh, that talk about us being delivered from the wrath to come. You know, we'll escape these things uh, that are coming to pass. It says, for they themselves declare concerning us what matter of entry we had to you. This is 1 Thessalonians 1.9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, again, the second coming, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Say again, delivers us from the wrath to come. Come on, delivers us from the wrath to come, meaning we don't have to go through what the world goes through. And that is in the context of his second coming. And uh, then in Isaiah 26, 19, I was just reading this the other day. It was, you know, again, it's amazing. It's talking about the rapture and really the, the, the uh, church age in which we live. He says, the dead shall live. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. This is prophetic. What is he saying? The, does the Bible say that we've been made alive together with Christ and we've been raised up together with him? You know, this is the Lord talking your dead body shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. Okay, you who dwell in dust. I mean, that could be the bodies of those who have passed away. Uh, and your dew, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. The earth shall, when's the earth going to cast out the dead? Resurrection. Resurrection. Absolutely. You know, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. It's First Thess Thessalonians 4. And he says, watch this. It says, come, my people. Okay, you, the earth is casting out our dead. Okay, you've got resurrection. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Wow. Hide yourselves for a little moment until the indignation is passed. That means the body of Christ being taken out, okay, being hidden while the indignation is going on in the earth. And, and the, Lord, the Lord again expounds that. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also will disclose her blood and no more cover her slain. That's talking about the tribulation period when a quarter of the world's population is wiped out, you know, with famine and war and, and the slain uh, can't be covered. You know, there's another third of all, all living that die at a certain point, I believe, when the waters are poisoned and all. And uh, it's absolutely amazing. So, again, that's the context, the Lord hiding his people, hiding his people. So we looked at that in the book of Revelation, again, last time, you know, where we, we saw that in Revelation chapter 4, to Revelation chapter 19, the word ecclesia or church is not found. It's not found. You know, you have uh, Revelation chapter 1, the vision of Jesus. You have Revelation chapters 2 and 3, chapters 2 and 3 here, where it talks about, you know, the, the exhortations and admonishments to uh, the seven churches of the book of Revelation, which are in Turkey. We saw that. And from, from uh, the beginning of chapter 4, John the apostle is caught up into heaven. 
He's caught up into heaven, and everything that he views about all the judgments and, and the, the seals and the trumpets and the vials, everything that he sees in the book of Revelation between chapters 4 and 19, he views from a heavenly perspective, okay? From heavenly perspective looking down. And so, again, that's talking about, you know, the rapture. It's talking about us being caught up in the spirit into heaven, looking down on the earth. And so in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, again, concerning the, the times and the seasons, Paul says, I have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Again, the second coming. Um, for when they say peace and safety, when the world says peace and safety, when they say we've got all the ills of mankind worked out, you know, we, we've got it all solved, all the problems are solved, all the difficulties uh, of the world are, are now sorted. It says, sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. They shall not escape. Did it say you would escape? Yes. Did it say they shall escape? No. Okay, if they're not ready. And it says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Again, you'll know the day. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll be so aware of the season that you'll literally be going any day now. Any day now. Okay? This day will not overtake you as a thief. So it won't come on you unexpectedly. You are all the sons of light and sons of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep in the night. And those who get drunk are drunk in the night. Okay? Um, and this, this is going to over, you know, it'll, it'll overtake them when they're unaware. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. God did not appoint us to wrath. Okay? He has delivered us from the wrath to come. Christ has delivered us from the wrath to come. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Christ, you know, coming back for his church. He's not appointed us to wrath. Who died for us, okay? Salvation is in Christ. Who died for us, and that whether we wake or sleep, we should be, uh, live together with him. Hallelujah. Therefore, comfort one another and edify one another, just as you have been doing. And uh, praise God, you know, and it goes on to exhort. It says, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. This, this has struck me really from a different angle in these times. You know, when, as, the time, as we're coming more and more to, to the second coming, to the, to the rapture, second coming, as, as we're seeing the world get crazier and, and crazier, this is an exhortation right on the back of that, that you should be sober, awake, aware of the times. And it says, you know what else you should do? And we urge you, recognize those who labor among you. Recognize the true apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, you know, uh, those who have a ministry in Christ and who are laboring among you. Recognize these people, you know, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. So what's the enemy going to try to do? Bring division? <laughs> of course, of course, that's, that's divide and conquer, right? You know, he wants to bring division. And it says you're to esteem those who labor in the word and doctrine, you know, very highly in love for their work's sake. You know, we, we need to know those that, that God has placed in the body that, that have ministries that are to be speaking to us in this time. There's pastors that God has given. You know, there's leaders, there's apostles, there's prophets. You know, teachers, <laughs> excuse me, teachers, <coughs> excuse me, teachers, um, evangelists, praise God. So some, just some more scriptures here. The marriage supper of the Lamb, you know, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, hold on, let me, uh, so, okay, so before, the, before again, uh, we get to talking about the um, the rapture. Let me let me just well let me just emphasize this a bit more. Uh, first, first, okay, I'm going to skip this part, will I? No, First Thessalonians five. We're going to read it. Concerning the times and seasons, brethren, we have no need to write to you. Okay, I read that. Okay, I thought that was a different one. Never mind. 
Let me go to the marriage feast. So we have to be ready. So in this time, again, uh, we have to recognize those who labor among us. Uh, we, we are to escape, you know, this, this wrath that is, is to come. Others shall not escape. Um, you remember that in Matthew 22, there was a parable that, that Jesus talked about called the marriage supper and the marriage feast. Let me just read that to you. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. And again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. This is a word that's going out right now. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, to another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. And those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all those whom they found, both bad and good. I like that, both bad and good. <laughs> you, can, you can go anywhere and give invitations right now, anywhere. The Lord is saying, nope, fill my house, okay, invite everyone, okay, the bad and the good. Praise God, we all have a new life in Christ, amen. And um, the wedding, the wedding uh, was... So, um, sorry, I went, I hit the wrong button there. So those servants went out into the highways, gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. He didn't have on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how do you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He was speechless. Really, the wedding garment is what you get from, through, and in Christ, in Christ. When you're serving him here on the earth, when you're ready for his return, when you're ready, you're the five wise virgins instead of the five foolish, you know, you're living for the Lord, uh, you get that invitation, that call, you're going up in the rapture, you know, God gives you uh, your righteousness, your, your garment, you've got a wedding garment, you're called to the table, praise God, but this man didn't have that, okay, you tried to get in another way. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness, again, there, I just got personal revelation on that. Outer darkness is the tribulation period. It's, it's the tribulation time in the book of Revelation that Jesus said there'll, there'll be no greater uh, time of, of tribulation upon the earth ever. You know, there, there never has been this amount of tribulation before, nor shall there ever be. Uh, as difficult and, and treacherous and, and dangerous and troublesome times as the tribulation period. That's what he's talking about in the outer darkness. For many are called, but few are chosen. So, you know, the Lord, the Lord exhorts his church, be ready. Be ready for the rapture. You know, be ready. And the five wise, five foolish virgins... Uh, the parable is here. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. And now five were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels and their lamps. Oil in their vessels, that means they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, They had the Holy Spirit within and they took their lamps, which is the word of God. We know David said in Psalm 119, Thy word's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. So... And uh, it says, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Again, we said that last week. <laughs> That's a troublesome statement, the church sleeping. You know, whether you're wise or foolish, the church wasn't aware. And I hope that doesn't fall back on the prophets. You know, it's like, you didn't shout loud enough. You didn't get your voice out there enough. Um, praise God. We're, we're to help wake the body of Christ. They were all sleeping. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. And they all, those virgins, arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Our lamps are gone out. That, again, just with personal revelation, 
The lamp's gone out. That means they aren't walking according to the revelation of the Holy Spirit. They aren't in communion with the Holy Spirit. They aren't living their life as led by the Spirit of God. You know, in Romans 14, uh, sorry, Romans 8, uh, uh, verse 14 and verse 16, it talks about the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And it says, they that are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You know, they that are led by the Spirit of God. You've got to be led. You know, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the, the word, the Holy Spirit, and the, the lamp. And uh, so they said, give us some of your, your oil, for our lamps are gone out, and you, just, you can't do it. The wise answer said, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those that sell and buy for yourselves. So in other words, they had to go you know, attempt to go through a whole process again whereby they're filled and where they're walking spirit-led and there just wasn't time for it. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those that were ready went in uh, with him to the wedding and the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. People who miss the rapture are going to say, Lord, open to us. He answered said, surely I say unto you, I, I know you're not, you know, like you, you missed it. You know, it, it just... It wasn't happening. So watch therefore, for you, you, for you know neither the day nor the hour the Son of Man is coming. So you don't know the day or the hour. Um, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who's on the housetop his goods, and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. Likewise, the one who's in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. That is a very, very powerful statement. Remember Lot's wife. Do you think, what happened to Lot's wife? She was being delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah. She was fleeing to a little city, Zoar. Uh, they, they were heading, you know, away from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and she looked back. Now, there must have been some kind of longing there, because, like, she wasn't supposed to look back. They weren't supposed to look. Uh, there must have been some kind of longing, something still in her heart, maybe that was attached to the iniquity that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. She thought, oh, all this is being destroyed. Oh, you know. She just turned to a pillar of salt. Do you think it would be possible for someone to nearly be going up in the rapture, but then they look around to what they're going to miss if they go, and then they don't go? I don't want to test that one, do you? I, I wouldn't want to put that to the test. Remember Lot's wife. In other words, you better be detached. You better be detached. You better not be looking and saying, I'm still in love with something in this earth. If you want to be part of the bride of Christ. You know, we can, you can enjoy things here, natural things, but our love is for him and him alone. And if, we're, if, we're, if he's calling us to leave here, I'm like, Great! Let's leave it all behind. <laughs> let's, let's go. Come on. Let's go. I'm ready. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're winding down here. And uh, in Revelation 18, or sorry, 19, it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The, the voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his saints and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a multitude as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Hallelujah. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. The marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Praise God. So again, that's that wedding garment. You know, and he said, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Powerful. Um, I know about five, six people that have had dreams about the rapture. Anybody here? Anybody dreams about the rapture? I, I've had one. It was absolutely powerful. It was like the Lord God put his face up to the side of the earth. That's how <laughs> it was. It was like, you know, I didn't see the face, but it was I was aware. It was like God put his face up to the side of the earth. There was like music in the air, and we were tr just caught up, transformed. We were going through the air at great speed, and the only thing that you were thinking about is the Lord. 
the Lord, being united with the Lord. And uh, in mine, it was so unusual. I said, Lord, uh, if I'm going up like this, I'd like to go with my wife also because you gave her to me in this life, you know. And uh, I didn't see her. It wasn't the thing where you turn to this, the side one way or the other. You're just completely focused on the Lord. But I felt my hand close on hers, you know, just going up at the same time. That was powerful. Um, my son Daniel had a dream about the rapture. Um, and uh, um, I know Alan Stevens, Pastor Alan Stevens of Glen Mackin Church of God, he told me about uh, his dream about the second coming of the Lord. I know other people. Um, but my son Daniel had this such an unusual dream. He said that people were going up. They were going up. And uh, as they're going up, he was he was doing this thing where he was he looked sideways at the beginning. He's, he's looking over at all the people of the earth. And he said all their faces were contorted. He said it was like they're all demon-possessed. They're all, all their faces were contorted, you know, raging and everything. Uh, and uh, he, he heard the Lord say to him, Daniel, look up. <laughs> and he was, he was going up then, you know, looking up. And he said that there were angels all around with white horses. Angels. This is not written in the scripture, but watch how amazing this is. Angels were all around with white horses. They weren't on the white horses. They were holding the white horses, and all the saints that went up to meet the Lord in the air got on the horses and went to heaven. They rode to heaven. Now, the reason that's so beautiful is because what it, where it does fit with Scripture is when we come back at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 19, when the Lord comes back to Armageddon, to, the, to, to battle, he comes back with ten thousands of his saints, all his saints, and he's on a white horse, and guess what? All of us are on white horses. Why wouldn't we be given a test ride? <laughs> Get to know your horse. You're going to war with it later <laughs> after the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's amazing. I thought that's beautiful. Again, I can't prove that from Scripture, but as uh, one minister said, you can't prove it ain't so either. <laughs> but um, no, that's just, that's just beautiful. I thought that was really nice. So praise the Lord. Um, absolutely wonderful. And Matthew 24, again, just lastly here, it says in uh, Matthew 24, 42, wherefore, watch, or watch therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming, okay, the hour. But again, you're going to be so aware of the day, it's not going to take you unawares. And it says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would, not, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. Okay? Coming at an hour when you do not expect. So the hour might surprise you, right? <laughs> but the day is not supposed to. Uh, who then is that faithful and wise servant? Now this again is, is beautiful. Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his house to give them food in due season? This is powerful. This is talking about, I believe, the ministers of the Lord again, who are feeding God's people. Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master made ruler over his household? Well, what's his household? His people, the church, to give them food in due season. Food, feeding the flock, feeding the flock in due season, in this time, in this time. It says, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. That means that no minister of the gospel anywhere, anybody that's got the word of God in your mouth, nobody is justified or has reason to desert, desert their post, okay? Close down their churches, close down their pulpits, okay? Walk away from feeding the saints. Absolutely not. You have no permission <laughs> from the Lord. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, shall find so doing. And verse 45 in different translations there, you know, it says, it says, who then is that faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? The word of God for this season, the word of God for this time. And it says a faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give responsibility. But you'll see all the other translations say, no, he has given that responsibility of managing his household servants and feeding them. 
Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his household to give others their food at the proper time? We, we need the word of God in this hour, don't we? More than ever. We need the word, the, the, the proper exhortation, the proper instruction for the time that we're living to be bold, to be strong, to be mighty, you know, to take our authority in Christ Jesus, to pray, you know, binding and loosing and, you know, rebuking the devil and uh, preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. Who then is that faithful and wise servant who his Lord has made ruler over his house to give meat in their season? Or... Uh, Beneath it says, uh, whose master made ruler over his house to give them food in due season. So they're all agreed. They're, they're all the same. You know, and that's, that's the Lord's exhortation. In this time, in this hour, we are to, to continue meeting. We are to continue uh, honoring, esteeming those who are, are preaching the word of God. Um, we're to be ready ourselves. We're to be alive, awake, sober, alert. You know, we're to have no attachments to things of this earth that, that would divert the love of our heart, you know, to, to things of the world versus the, you know, things that are in heaven, you know. Um, our affections should be on heavenly things. Glory to God. And... Uh, Praise God, you know, and, and just lastly, we should be about the work of the Lord because this is harvest time, isn't it? This is harvest time, and, and that is the, the last exhortation, you know, of uh, the scripture, that the Lord is, is patient. You know, he's, he's long-suffering, James 5, 7, he's long-suffering for the, the uh, precious fruit of the earth. The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it, until it receives the early and the latter rain. And, and we know that the scripture talks about the parable of the wheat and tares, you know, how that the, the tares will eventually be gathered up into bundles and burned, but the wheat will be gathered into his garner. The Lord is, is saying to us, be strong in this hour, preach the word, stand your ground, have your affections on heavenly things, you know, respect those again that, that are laboring, um, you know, no one is to desert their post and uh, work together to reap the harvest, amen? I love this picture here because that's like the church is working together, isn't it? You know, church is working together to reach the lost, to cast the net, to bring in all kinds of fish, you know, to, to bring the wheat into his garner, praise God. And uh, that, that's really the message of this, this hour and this time. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, preach the gospel. Whatever you're doing, share Christ with others. Whatever you're doing, let's keep exhorting people to to be at the master's table, you know, the marriage supper of the lamb, to, to fill the seats at, at his table. And that invitation is going out. So I think that's what we're going to be doing up to 2030. Uh, again, the Global Church Network has the vision to finish the Great Commission by 2030. I believe that that's, you know, what, what the Lord wants. Amen. It has to be finished sometime. Come on. <laughs> And uh, they've shown that through population growth and the, the current levels of evangelism, you know, if we increase, just in, increase our efforts to intersect that population growth, that we can actually do this. We can actually reach the unreached people groups of the earth. Uh, they're majoring on the last 3,000 hardest to reach people groups. Uh, we can actually do this by 2030. Amen. And um, they have already, you know, translated the Bible into 700 different uh, unreached people group languages. But it's up to us guys to reach those around us. Isn't that right? Every day. Every day. So let's just thank God. Amen. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we just thank you. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for making us aware, aware in this hour, Lord, of the hour, the time that we're living. Lord, how close we are. Lord, that it's our generation. God, we don't want to be asleep. We don't want uh, this, this time to overtake us unawares, God. We want to be awake and alert and alive. Lord, we want to be about our Father's business. We, we want to be laborers together with our Lord uh, in the harvest field. Lord, uh, you working through us each and every day. God, we, we want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord God, we want to walk in the light of your word. Amen. Every day, Lord God. And we just thank you for all these divine appointments, Father, for all the things and the works and the visions and the dreams which you still have to accomplish in and through our lives, Lord God, corporately and individually. Lord, we thank you that you will finish your work. You will complete your work, complete your work in us through the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, not by might, not by power, God, by your Spirit. God, we rely upon you, Lord, and, and you're exhorting your church 
Lord, to, to labor and to be focused more than ever before, God, and we will not be distracted by headlines. We will not be uh, distracted by the news cycle. God, we will keep our focus on what you have called us to do, and we know that you are with us even until the end, Lord God, until we leave this place. Amen. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> thank you for the word, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. This is good stuff, guys. It really is. <laughs> I know it's a little long, but it's good stuff. It, it sets you in a different place. When you get this all in your heart, it just sets you in a different place. Amen. You walk with your head high. Hallelujah. Amen. You know who you are in Christ and what we're here for. You don't ever have to apologize for sharing the gospel. Amen. <laughs> yep. I'll go to any church. Preach away. So let me know. Don't, you know, it's not an issue of money. I don't care if I get, you know, I don't care if I have it or don't have it. <laughs> it's about preaching, isn't it? Yeah, it's about sharing. So love to, you know, let's, let's do it all over the world. This is going to be online as well, uh, which you can share and um, share with others. So, amen. So that's just part two of uh, End Times, A Clear View. <laughs> we did a series a number of years back called... Uh, you know, the end times, a clear view. We did the book of Revelation things. I'll, I, I plan to put those up as well. Um, those were audio at the time, but they can be put in with, you know, pictures and charts and can, can set them into YouTube in a, in a creative way. Um, but, um, yeah.